we see that this promise of Swamiji didn't went in vain. He kept his promise and that promise was witnessed in the life of the great Sri Aurobindo. His idea shared the views of Swamiji as well. When you find the yoga we practice is not for ourselves alone but for the divine. Its aim is to walk out of the will of the divine in the world, to effect a spiritual transformation and to bring down a divine nature and a divine life into the mental, vital and physical nature and the life of humanity. Its object is not personal mukti, although mukti is a necessary condition of the yoga, but the liberation and transformation of human being in all. It is not personal ananda, but the bringing down of the divine ananda, Christ's kingdom of heaven, our Satya Yuga upon the earth. Now, may I request Honorable Sri Ranjan Mitter, Secretary of Sri Aurobindo Institute of Culture, to deliver an address on the subject Sri Aurobindo and his philosophy. Respected Swami Supanandaji, respected Swami Supanandaji, and everyone here at Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, dear Srimati Gauri Basu, Director of EZCC, and everyone assembled here, and I believe this is being uh, also broadcast live, so everyone who's watching. First of all, I feel truly blessed. I feel honored, of course, by the invitation of Swami Supanandaji, whom I deeply respect. And when he called and requested me, I, of course, didn't say no. And of course, I have a long association. I admire Srimati Gauri Basu and her work a lot. So she also spoke. So, in fact, so that was sealed. But when Swamiji, Swami Supanandaji told me that I had to speak at the Vivekananda Hall, I considered myself truly blessed. Shayok has been at pains to explain to all of us here that the, a, a session on Swami Vivekananda and Sri Aurobindo from the same platform is not just coincidental. And I would subscribe completely as an Aurobindonian to that point of view. In fact, as Shayok rightly pointed out, a huge and decisive turn of Sri life was in Alipur jail and Swami Vivekananda spent several weeks with him initiating him to the concept of the intuitive mind, which is one of the seven stages of the super mind as Sri has coined it. Anyway, so therefore, I feel hugely blessed that at the feet of Swamiji, I can deliver this address. It was 150 years ago. We can't forget that because this is his 150 years. 150 years ago, on 15th of August, 1872, at the crack of dawn, in this very city that Shurabindu was born. The first five years of his life was spent with his parents in Rangpur, which is now in Bangladesh. And in 1879, he was sent along with his two elder brothers, uh, sorry, uh, uh, to England. This was, of course, after two years in Loreto Convent, Darjeeling. At Manchester in England, he stayed with a clergyman, Mr. Drewett and his wife. And the brief given by his father, Dr. Krishnadan Ghosh, was that his children should receive an entirely European upbringing with no contact or, or with any Indian and with Indian influence. And of course, Mr. and Mrs. Druitt followed that to the T. 
So Mr. Druitt initiated him to the concepts of, and his brothers, to the concept of Christianity, also taught him Latin very, very well, and with that basis he continued with Greek later on, and became a brilliant scholar in Greek and Latin, of course, but also French, German, and Italian. In 1884, that means after five years in Manchester, Sherbindo moved as a student, of course, and still in school, to St. Paul's in London, and spent six years there. In 1890, he was admitted as a probationer to the ICS, the Indian Civil Service, in the month of July, and in the same year, went on a scholarship to King's College, Cambridge. At Cambridge, he was to join the Indian Majlis, which was a student's group, and made several speeches advocating India's freedom. So it was at the age of 18 that he started publicly, in a sense, although it was a very small gathering of people, uh, speaking about India's freedom. Two years later, in 1892, in the month of May, and I, I deliberately use these months, you know, you, you will understand why, in a short while, he passed the first part of the classical tripos with the first class. And in August, he passed the ICS exam. So he'd already cleared the classical tripos with the first class. And in August, he had cleared the written examination of the Indian Civil Service with flying colors, with doing very, very well. In October, of course, having completed his course, he leaves Cambridge and returns to London. And along with others then forms a secret society called Lotus and Dagger, again devoted to Indian freedom. In the same year, in November 1892, he did not deliberately present himself for the riding examination. He did so because he could not, you know, to his father, whose entire objective was that, you know, he would train as an administrator and come back as a brilliant ICS officer to India with his English upbringing. He could not bear or countenance the fact that he would have to disappoint his father. So he deliberately chose the path of not presenting himself for the riding exam and disqualified himself from the ICS. Meanwhile, of course, his father, Dr. K. D. Ghosh, was sending him newspapers, uh, particularly the Bengali, making cases of maltreatment of Indians by Englishmen. Of course, Dr. Krishnodhan Ghosh's ostensible purpose was that Shurbindo, seeing these articles, would derive an independent view of how to govern India when he would come back as a qualified ICS officer. But as you can quite well realize, the effect it had on him was quite the opposite. Indian Majlis first, Lotus and Dagger second, you know, uh, public speeches uh, advocating India's freedom. None of this probably Dr. K.D. Ghosh had even imagined in his wildest dreams. In the meanwhile, at the age of 11, just 11, when he was still a schoolboy, Shurbin had already received strongly the impression that a period of general upheaval and great revolutionary changes was coming in the world, and he himself was destined to play a part in it. His attention was now drawn to India, and this feeling was soon canalized into the idea of the liberation of his own country, which solidified in a matter of four years by the age of 15. So you can see how, as a young boy and in his, you know, in his teenage, the idea of India's freedom really unfolded. In 1892, when he was 14 years old, he had his first pre experience, he calls it, the mental experience of the Atman. So in fact, what you see in him on one side, the, the student, on the second side, a person advocating the liberation of India, on a third side, a spiritual realization. These were not divorced from each other, as was pointed out a little while ago as well. On February 6, 1893, coincidentally the same year that, Shurbin, uh, that Swami Vivekananda was journeying to Chicago for the Parliament of Religions, Sri Aurobindo arrived at Apollo Bandar in Bombay. And the moment he arrived, it was completely an altered feeling. 
and he recounts it as follows. He says, a vast peace and calm descended on him, never to leave again. This is, he said in the third person. In the close of his stay in, uh, in England, in the month of December of the previous year, he had made the acquaintance of uh, Maharaja Sayaji Rao Gaikwad, the Maharaja of Baroda, and had, you know, ingratiated him. And, you know, uh, the Maharaja thought that he was brilliantly qualified for an administrative service uh, with the Maharaja. It was a prize catch, in fact, for him. And he started working in Baroda from 1893. In fact, he lived there for close to 13 years. And he worked in various administrative departments. But the Maharaja spotted academic talent in him, thought that he would make a great teacher, and moved him later, first as a teacher of French, then a teacher of English, eventually an education administrator, a vice principal, and in his last years as an acting principal of Baroda College, which is now the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University in Baroda. So, this is his Baroda period. Now, the political action of Sri Aurobindo actually didn't start in Calcutta. It started in 1902 in Baroda. So, what happened at that point in 1902 was that he sent, uh, in 1900 actually, he sent Jyotindranath Banerjee to Bengal as his lieutenant for revolutionary organization and propaganda. Meanwhile, in 1893, just after arriving in Baroda, while they, he was in real danger of a carriage accident, he had a vision of a godhead surging up within him. So the two movements happening parallelly. In 1894, in a friend's uh, journal, New Lamps for Old, uh, sorry, uh, Indu Prakash, which was published from Bombay, he serialized several articles, uh, essays called New Lamps for Old. Parallelly, he wrote a lot of poetry in those years. In nine, starting in 1902, and that's when we say he started his political action, he started using his vacations from the Baroda service to organize revolutionary work in Bengal. In 1903, on a visit to Srinagar with the Maharaja of Baroda, at the Takti Suleiman, he experienced the vacant infinite. Between 1902 and 1907, he attended several sessions of the Indian National Congress. The first one being at Ahmedabad, where he made the acquaintance of Lokmanya Tilak. Then in 1904 in Bombay, in 1905 in Benares, in 1906 in Calcutta, and eventually in 1907 in Surat, which witnessed the break, the formal breakup of the Congress into moderate and nationalist or extremist factions, depending on how you call it. All right? So now let us move a little bit to understanding a little bit his philosophy. So this is now from Sri Aurobindo himself. He says, the political action of Sri Aurobindo covered eight years, from 1902 to 1910. During the first half of this period, he worked behind the scenes, preparing with co-workers the beginnings of the Swadeshi, Indian Sinn Féin movement, you know, Sinn Féin being the uh, movement in the Irish Republic, till the agitation in Bengal furnished an opening for the public initiation of a more forward and direct political action than the moderate reformism which had till then been the creed of the Indian National Congress. In, in 1906, Sri Aurobindo came to Bengal with this purpose and joined the new party, an advanced section small in numbers and not yet strong in influence, which had been recently formed in the Congress. The political theory of this party was a rather vague gospel of non-cooperation. The newborn Nationalist Party put forward Swaraj independence as its goal, as against the far-off moderate hope of colonial self-government to be realized at a distant date of a century or two by a slow progress of reform. And Sri Aurobindo hoped to capture the Congress and make it 
the directing center of an organized national action, an informal state within the state, which would carry on the struggle for freedom till it was won. So that, in fact, was his political philosophy as we understand it. Meanwhile, cutting back to the action, on March 12, 1906, uh, sorry, on March 11, 1906, he was in Calcutta for the formation of the National Council for Education. And that is the precursor of Jadavpur University where Professor Iman Kul and Lahiri, of course, currently teaches. On the very next day, on March 12, Jugantar was launched, a Bengali weekly. Sri Aurobindo wrote several articles in early numbers and later exercised a general control over it. In the same year, a few months later, August, he joined Bipin Chandrapal in the editing of the Bande Mataram and became the assistant editor of that uh, journal. On August, in August 1906, he took charge of Bande Mataram and the policies of the Nationalist Party. Now coming back to 1907, 1907 now represents a very eventful year as we just saw. That is the year of the breakup between the moderates and the extremists in the Surat Congress. But at the same time, in the same year, he was arrested for seditious writing in the Bande Mataram and he was released on bail. And in December of that year, Sri Aurobindo gives the order that leads to the breaking of the Congress. So the same year. So coming back to the uh, you know arrest and release, after you know uh, you know that happened, Rabindranath Tagore met him at a very interesting address, and that is at Wellington Square, you know, in the house of Raja Shubhut Chandra Mullik. And Rabindranath uh, told him, "Ama ke to." because he had written the poem Namaskar by the time Aurobindo Rovindre Laho Namaskar imagining that he was already in jail so but Shurabindo stoically replied and that was his hallmark for the for his entire lifetime he said not for long so a very interesting uh, you know uh, story in the same house of Raja Shubhut Chandra Mollik, he had been seen several times. He stayed in a first floor room. He had been seen several times by a servant to be levitating quite a few feet above the bed. All right. So in 1908, back in Baroda in January, he met Vishnu Bhaskar Lele. This was a yogi. And with his help, in a few days' time, he established the silence of mind, attaining to the experience of the silent Brahman. On 2nd May of that year, just after the infamous, uh, you know, the bomb that was thrown on, uh, at, it was attempted on Kingsford in Muzaffarpur by Khudiram and Prabhupada Chaki, so just after that incident, and of course it went on the wrong carriage and uh, innocent English civilians were ki killed. So he was arrested from his lodgings at Gray Street, which was the office of Navashakti. And on 5th May, after staying in lockup in uh, uh, Lal Bazar for three days, he was taken to Alipur jail and eventually into solitary confinement. Coming back to another facet of his political philosophy, and this is a letter to his wife. He had meanwhile married in 1901, if I'm not wrong. And in this letter, he talks about three madnesses, a very famous letter of his, and I read the translation, the original is in Bengali. He says the third madness is, whereas others regard the country as an inert piece of matter and know it as the plains, the fields, the forests, the mountains and the rivers, I know my country as the mother. I worship and adore her accordingly. So this was his view, his understanding of what India represented. On a different note, in a different essay on Rishi Bunkim Chandra, Sri Aurobindo wrote in that same period, it is not till the motherland reveals herself to as a great divine and maternal power in a form of beauty that can dominate the mind and seize the heart, 
that these petty fears and hopes vanish in the all-absorbing passion for our mother and her service, and the patriotism that works miracles and saved a doomed nation is born. And he continues, it was 32 years ago that Bonkim wrote his great song, and he alludes to the song of Ande Mataram, and few listened. But in a sudden moment of awakening from long delusions, the people of Bengal looked around for the truth, and in a fated moment, somebody sang Bande Mataram. The mantra had been given, and in a single day, a whole people had been converted to the religion of patriotism. The mother had revealed herself. Once that vision has come to a people, there can be no rest, no peace, no further slumber, till the temple has been made ready, the image installed, and the sacrifice offered. A great nation which has had that vision can never again be placed under the feet of the conqueror. So, as I told you, on, sec on 5th of May, Shirobindo was taken to Alipur jail, eventually to be put into solitary confinement. He spent the entire one year, he was released on 6th May of the following year, reading the Gita, the Upanishads, in meditation and in yoga. And as I recounted at the beginning of my address, he spent three weeks with Swami Vivekananda, who initiated him initially and gave him clues of the supermind without exactly using that expression. In 1909, Sri Aurobindo was acquitted by none other than his friend, Justice Beechcroft, and Justice Beechcroft, C.R. Beechcroft, was his uh, friend, and uh, not his friend, but his uh, fellow student from Cambridge. One of the things that we think was instrumental in his release was the famous closing speech of Siad Das, who was the defense counsel. And Siad Das prophetically said, my appeal to you therefore is that a man like this, who is being charged with the offenses imputed to him, stands not only before the bar in this court, but stands before the bar of the high court of history. And my appeal to you is this, that long after this controversy is hushed in silence, long after this turmoil, this agitation ceases, long after he is dead and gone, he will be looked upon as the poet of patriotism, as the prophet of nationalism, and the lover of humanity. Long after he is dead and gone, his words will be echoed and re-echoed, not only in India, but across distant seas and lands. Therefore I say that the man in his position is not only standing before the bar of this court, but before the bar of the High Court of History. So Sri was acquitted to a hero's welcome on the 6th of May 1909. I should mention in passing that in Surat, when he was going to attend the Surat Congress, History recounts that he was received at every railway station like a king. That is what the British newspapers of that age wrote. Now, I, I should also comment a little bit on the demeanor of Sherbindo while in jail. And you see, he was absolutely, when people saw him in court, he was absolutely calm, relaxed, with no worries. And he gave no brief. And the reason he explained on 30th May 1909, in a public speech at Uttarpara Library, the Jai Krishna Library. And he says, I looked at the jail that secluded me from men, and it was no longer by its high walls that I was imprisoned. No, it was Vasudeva who surrounded me. I walked under the branches of the tree in front of my cell, but it was not the tree. I knew it was Vasudeva. It was Sri Krishna whom I saw standing there, and holding over me his shade. I looked at the bars of my cell, the very grating that did duty for a door, and again I saw Vasudeva. It was Narayana who was guarding and standing sentry over me. Or I lay on the coarse blankets that were given me for a couch, and felt the arms of Sri Krishna around me, the arms of my friend 
and lover. So you see the entire experience, and he recounts that in his Bengali book, Karakahini, that the British thought they sent him to jail, but it turned out to be a year of ashram life. So I, you know, dare say that Sri Aurobindo Ashram in that sense, the first incarnation was not founded in Pondicherry, but was in a solitary cell in Alipur. In 1910, when he was working in the office of the Dharma in Shampukur, he got an inner call, something that he had been used to ever since that speech where I recounted his, you know, his speaking about his religion of patriotism. He had got used to an inner voice and to listen to its command. And this voice told him to leave immediately for Chandanagar. He packed his bags, went to the ghat, boarded the boat, arrived in Chandanagar, stayed with his friend Motilal Roy for uh, a month, and during that period wrote essays which later were serialized, or rather published as a book, a System of National Education. On March 31, 1910, historic date, he leaves Bengal by the SS Duplay, and on 4th April 1910, he arrived in Pondicherry. He stayed at various houses, moved lodgings several times, stayed with sympathizers, met Kavi Subramanya Bharati, another sympathizer of uh, Indian nationalism at that point in time. Some revolutionaries went along with him, some others joined him later on, a small group of people. And in 1914, Mira Al-Fasa, whom we now revere and know as the mother, arrived and met him on the 29th of March, 1914. The mother and her husband, Paul Richard, were instrumental in convincing Sherbindo to start another journal. Remember by now, Sherbindo was quite accomplished at that, with Jugantar and Bande Mataram to start with. After his release, it was Dharma in Bengali and Karma Yogin in English, and now came the Arya. And in the Arya, Sherbindo started serializing several works at the same time. And they were Secret of the Veda, Isha Upanishad, The Life Divine, and synthesis of yoga. And 1918 to this list was added, is India civilized? This entire work spanned roughly to around 1920, by which all of Sherbindo's major works were complete. Now, what is the character of Sherbindo's complete works? If we just pause for a moment and see. On one side, there is a huge work on Indian culture which is titled The Foundations of Indian Culture. It starts with this article, which he wrote in 1918 in the Arya, uh, Is India Civilized? It was in response to a, a somebody called William Archer writing an essay on the same topic, and Sherbindo writing back on that. And the way, the style he writes is very interesting. He, he takes that thing, Is India Civilized? That is the first part. And he comments on William Archer's article. Then there is an entire section with several chapters where Sherwindo kind of steps out and considers himself an Occidental. Mind you, he spent 21 years without knowing a word of Bengali. It was only in Baroda that from Dinendra Kumar Rai he picked up some Bengali and of course he learned Gujarati, Marathi and Sanskrit. So that entire Occidental view, and he wrote several sections, several chapters, under the title, A Rationalistic Critic of Indian Culture. And then, stepping inside the circle, as it were, inside the Lakshman Rekha, he serialized another set of chapters, which he called The Defense of Indian Culture. In all this, he dealt at length with Indian literature, Indian poetry, Indian music, Indian dance, Indian architecture, Indian philosophy, Indian religion, Indian science, Indian mathematics, the entire exposition as if he was opening an entire horizon to his countrymen. At the same time, as I said in Arya, he serialized essays on the Gita. And again, the same style. Where his first chapter in that book is our demand and need from the Gita. He tries to seek the reader's understanding, is the Gita at all required to be read? our demand and need from the Gita. The second chapter in that book is equally interesting. He goes to the central character of 
the Gita, Krishna himself. The second chapter is titled, The Divine Teacher. The third chapter is equally apt, The Human Disciple. And the fourth chapter, The Core of the Teaching. I'm just telling you how Sri Aurobindo exposes in his work. Another very interesting book on India is called The Secret of the Veda. And where Sri Aurobindo challenges the, the interpretations given by Sayana, goes to the deep depths of etymology, the roots of Indian of words of that time, that's probably written in Brahmic script, and tries to derive what was the symbolism and seeks to understand the Vedas more as a symbol and as the pinnacle of Indian wisdom literature. Very, very interesting book, even for somebody who's just keen to understand language. So how to understand a language which is apparently lost? Because the Sanskrit of five or 7,000 years ago is not understood anymore. So how do you go back to that time, discover and you know, uncover the secrets and come out with what could have been the real intent of the seers in saying and invoking and offering the invocations the way they did. And of course an entire serial started with the Upanishads and Isha Upanishad and the entire set of Upanishads. There were his new thoughts in his original writings, like the life divine, his magnum opus, the synthesis of yoga, where he looks at all the forms of yoga and tries to synthesize them into one. And an entire set of work on the human cycle, where he talks of the cycle of reason, so on and so forth. The ideal of human unity, where he talks of the League of Nations and the United Nations. And war and self-determination, where he talks of the First World War. And of course, as you know, later on in Pondicherry, he was very active in following the Second World War and trying to put his spiritual force uh, in motion to see to it that that fight came to a logical fruition for humanity. A third section of his work, very importantly, the one that he continued lifelong, is very interesting. And that is that work which he started in England as a child, as a young boy, poetry. And in the aria, you see his works that, you know, poems continued, sonnets and other kinds of poems. And then there were also poems in new meters, and long poems, short poems, various kinds of poems. And eventually, his other magnum opus, his epic, if you call it one, in the style of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which is also, Shabindu calls it a legend and a symbol, Savitri, which talks of how the earth gets rescued by Savitri and divinized. So the divinization of matter is at the core of Sherbindo's message in his 25,000 lines in Savitri. But an equally important book, Savitri's 25,000 lines, probably as on today, I haven't checked my facts of late, but probably the longest epic written in the English language. But this equal sense and equally important is a small book, probably the smallest book written by Sri which is titled The Mother. As I was introduced, you heard I come from Sri Institute of Culture. It was established by a gentleman of the Tagore family, Sri Arunendranath Tagore. And Arunendranath Tagore said, I have not understood the life divine, but what I've done is I've memorized the mother. And even there, I've not been able to practice even a line. It's a very jokingly, he was a you know, great, uh, great man, and a very humble man, and this is what he had to say. Very, very interesting. So the mother was, is an equally important work that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that was uh, written by Sherbindu. Now let me just try and tell you his, you know, his, basically his vision. So he had five dreams of, in, of India. One is, he talks about an India that is one and undivided, and he says, by some means, this partition must go. He says this on the 15th of August, 1947. He says that the fact that India becomes independent or became independent on his 75th birthday was not a coincidence. Rather, and not something fortuitous, but rather a decision of the divine. 
His second dream, and he said at that point in time itself, and we have seen in the following 75 years, even more of that coming true, the resurgence and liberation of the peoples of Asia and a return to her great role in the progress of human civilization. If anything, the last 75 years has seen the huge resurgence, the huge rise of Asia as an economic power, even as a military power, and of many scientific inventions, innovations, many business thoughts. It's a whole thing. The third dream Sherwinder talked about was a world dream forming the outer basis of a fairer, brighter, and nobler life for all mankind. In 1968, the mother gave shape or germinated the seed of that thing in an experiment which she called Oroville, 10 kilometers from Pondicherry, where it is an UNESCO project and the soil of 128 nations, that was the number of nations at that time, members of UNESCO gave their soil and which is put in an urn in the amphitheater in the central center of Oroville. The the fourth dream of Sherbindo, and he said at that point in time, the spiritual gift to, of India to the world has already begun. So that, of course, we can thank, first of all, the pioneering spirit here, Swami Vivekananda. It was he who actually started giving that gift of spirituality of India to the contemporary model world. And the final dream, he said, was a step in evolution which would raise man to a higher and larger consciousness and begin the solution of the problems which have perplexed and vexed him since he first began to think and to dream of individual perfection and a perfect society. For that, he talks about the descent of the supermind. Now, let me try and see the whole character of Sherbindo's life, if you will. He reached a high pinnacle in Cambridge. He had secured first class in the classical tripos. He was about to become a brilliant administrator of the ICS. He had scored lovely marks in the uh, ICS written examination. He turned his back and he came back for India's freedom. He went to Baroda. He rose to become acting principal of Baroda College. He could have been a great academic, a great educationist, done great work for national education further on, not just writing articles and teaching, but you know, done more as an administrator of a princely state. He turned his back on it. In 1910 and thereafter, he was offered several times to become president of the Indian National Congress at his various sessions. He turned his back on it. He chose a life of seclusion. And in 1926, which is called the descent of the overmind, which he says is the descent of the Krishna consciousness on earth and in him and you know, in, in there, there also he turned his back on it because he wanted to proceed on his quest for this deeper perfection and this greater truth which he called the supermind, which eventually descended into his body and that is why there was this bluish golden light emanating from his body when he passed away and his body laid apparently immortal between the 5th and the 9th of December 1950 and that light the supramental light the supramental consciousness descended six years after he passed away or five years after he passed away in 1956 on the 29th of February now are therefore then these complete turnarounds of Sherbindo's life a change of conviction? I would say no. I read to you a little while ago that letter to Mrinalini where he talked about his third madness. In the same year he wrote Durga Stotra 1909 and he wrote the following in the concluding stanzas. Mother Durga when we possess thee, we shall no longer cast thee away. We shall bind thee to us with the tie of love and devotion. Come, revealer of the hero path, we shall no longer cast thee away. May our entire life become a ceaseless worship of the mother. All our acts are continuous service to the mother, full of love, full of energy. I just shared with you that Savitri and the mother are essentially the, the, the core of his philosophy and the core of his teaching, if you will. And you see, this is very interesting. So we've covered, so it is that worship of the mother 
the mother as mother india the mother as the divine mother the mother that one could speak to in fact if you go on to that speech the present situation which he gave in bombay he talks intimately of ramakrishna paramansa and and of his direct experience of meeting the mother face to face and he continues with that and he continues considers that as the core of indian nationalism the finding of the mother the quest of the mother the finding of the mother and the establishment of the mother that is what i would say is the core of things and it's very interesting that you know when he left the bengal national college he said something very interesting he said i wish to see and he told his students some of you becoming great great not for your own sakes not that you may satisfy your vanity but great for her to make india great to enable her to stand up with head erect among the nations of the earth as she did in days of your when the world looked up to her for light i want to see even those who will remain poor and obscure i want to say their very poverty and obscurity devoted to the motherland there are times in the nation's history when providence places before it one work one aim to which everything else however high and noble in itself has to be sacrificed such a time has now arrived for our motherland when nothing is dearer than her service when everything else is to be directed to that one end now we may ask ourselves what is it that we need to do shobindo has said this to the youth of bengal to the youth of india so but you know he says elsewhere also our call is to the youth of india but what exactly does he want us to do so shobindo says elsewhere the schemes by which we seek to prepare the nation the scheme of industrial regeneration the scheme of educational regeneration the scheme of political regeneration through self help are subordinate features of the deeper regeneration which the country must go through before it can be free the mother asks us for no schemes no plans no methods she herself will provide the schemes the plans the methods better than any that we can devise she asks us for our hearts our lives nothing less nothing more and finally at various points in time we ask ourselves is the nation going in the right direction the nation is going to be 75 we just witnessed the 75th you know what is this called the azadi ki amrit mahotsav have we matured as a nation have we arrived i think shorbindo asks us to ask that question to the mother in, our, in ourselves to ask that of ourselves and to look at our duty and he tells us they must have the firm faith that india must rise and be great and that everything that happened every difficulty every reverse must help and further their end the trend was upward and the time was decline the time of decline was over the morning was at hand and once the light had shown itself it could never be night again the dawn would soon be complete and the sun rise over the horizon the sun of india's destiny would rise and fill all india with its light and overflow india and overflow asia and overflow the world every hour every moment could only bring them nearer to the brightness of the day that god had decreed shrivinda was once asked are you are you convinced that your work will succeed he said yes he paused he said yes he was a man of few words and he said even if i had known otherwise i wouldn't have done anything differently and he put that as his concluding paragraph in his book the mother and that is what i would conclude with and he talks here of that final change his fifth dream the supramental change is a thing decreed and inevitable in the evolution of the earth consciousness for its upward ascent is not ended and mind is not its last summit but that the change may arrive take form and endure there is needed the call from below with a will to recognize and not deny the light when it comes and there is needed the sanction of the supreme from above
The power that mediates between the sanction and call is the presence and power of the Divine Mother. The Mother's power and not any human endeavor and tapasya can alone rend the lid and tear the covering and shape the vessel and bring down into this world of obscurity and falsehood and death and suffering truth and light and life divine and the immortal's ananda. Namaskar.